Namaste, everybody. Lisa A. Romano here, the Breakthrough Life Coach, and I am so glad that you are here um, and that you are participating in this webinar. I'm not screen sharing tonight because I want this webinar to be as personal as possible. I want to hear from you. Just let's just jump right into it, right? I wanted this to be a personal webinar. I wanted to have a sufficient amount of time to answer your questions um, and see what your feelings are about codependency. So codependency, I think, is epidemic. If you're like me and you discovered that you were um, codependent, it might have come as a complete shock um, to you that that's actually what was wrong. I know I was shocked. For years, I felt off. And for years, I felt like something was wrong. I'd gone to about four or five therapists and no one had said anything to me about my childhood. No one ever asked me um, about narcissistic abuse. No one ever mentioned alcoholism. You know, my grandparents, are they alcoholics? The question never even came up. No one asked me if I felt um, degraded or marginalized or um, if I felt like possibly I was in, in a controlling relationship, that never came up. What I found was that I was told that I was depressed. I was, I was told that um, one therapist told me that I wasn't loving my ex-husband enough, that I wasn't trying hard enough. And I was like, what? Like, lady, all I do is try. Like, you have no idea how hard I try. You know, when we're codependents, it's like, we we're dying to feel connected and seen with other people most oftentimes. And we're, that's all we do is try. And very oftentimes we attract people who can't hear us, right? Um, who are narcissistic or who are alcoholics or, ha or have some other issue. And, you know, we feel better when we're caretaking, you know, very often codependents feel their sense of self, their sense of self-esteem is coming from the catering to and the taking care of other people, which is really, really freaking sad. Because if you think about it, you have two people in a relationship and both people are worried about the one person. So like, where is the soul? Where is the life of the person that's doing all the caretaking, right? Where is the life or the soul of the person or the joy of the person that is taking care of everything, that is running around with their head, like their head has been chopped off, you know, trying to make everybody happy. Where do you exist? You don't, you know, this is, this is, you know, I was married into a very Italian family. And I can tell you that what I observed in this Italian family was codependency. I'm not stereotyping. I'm just, this is my experience, but it was almost like, it was expected for the women to cater. You know, it was expected that the that the men were just, you know, catered to and that the that women had um, the women in the family had no right to speak, that they had no right to have an opinion. And their job was to just make sure that the men in the family were happy. This happens with men who cater to women, too. This isn't just a, you know, women are codependent thing. Men can be codependent too. Men can come from homes where they watch their fathers cater to their mothers and now they are catering to their wives and their children and they don't have a healthy sense of self. So if you're a man and you had dad, you had a dad who had very poor boundaries, you might be mimicking that behavior in your own life. It's just what happens. Codependency is, you know, it's it's learned. We learn it as children, but it's also not only do we learn it, but it's also, you know, um, some people say that it's rooted in a lack of self-love and other people say that it's rooted in shame. I believe that, but I think there's the layer below that is abandonment. There's a sense of abandonment, abandonment for this inner child, this, this being, right? So if you understand a little bit of child psychology, the first year of life, every newborn, you were a newborn, I'm talking to you, but every person born was a newborn, right? Was newly born. And within a first, the first year of life, a newborn is trying to figure out, is this a safe place or is this an unsafe place? So 
it's sort of like being dropped off at Mars. Here you are, this newborn being dropped off at in you know on planet Earth, right? You don't know what's going on, right? You are completely powerless, but your senses, right? Your autonomic nervous system is tuned up with the environment. And your brain knows you've been coded what it needs. You need to be fed, you need to be warm, right? You need to be held, you need to be coddled. This is all pre-programmed into the mind or into the, into the brain or the being or the nervous system of a newborn. And when we are not fed, when our home is unpredictable, when we do not form close, invisible, amazing bonds with the people who are supposed to take care of us, things go awry, right? So we, our brain is supposed to be developing in a certain way, right? And if we come from stable, loving homes, then our brain, the limbic system is able to branch and, and, and develop nicely. But when you live with constant trauma or constant drama and there is no soft landing, then your brain is actually wired for survival, not thriving. By the time you're three, you should have, I matter, you know, Angela matters, you know, um, Anita matters, you know, Brenda matters, Camille matters. I have a self, people see me, I matter, right? So when we look into our caretaker's eyes and we see value, we know that they're connecting to us. Our minds, our psychology, our personality is developing a sense of worthiness for the self that we are. If we come from homes where your emotions are not valued, then as a child, you have to understand that you were, you were one with your emotions, right? As adults, hopefully we learn, and that's part of what I teach, is we learn that we are not our emotions, right? That our emotions are indicators. We are so much more than our emotions. Emotions are experiences. But when you're depressed and when you live in fear, right, you have CPTSD and your amygdala is highly activated, it's very difficult to separate from your emotions, right? When you're afraid to be alone, you're clinging, right? So that fear of being alone, which is really a fear of abandonment trauma and facing that abandonment trauma will make you cling. You don't know that that fear is an experience and it can be observed. You don't know that. When you're little and you have fear, you are one with that fear, right? When you don't feel good enough, you identify, I am not good enough. What we don't realize is that we're in a theta brainwave state up until about the age of seven. And, you know, we are, we, we have many dimensions. We have a brain. We have a subconscious mind. That's one part of the issue. Our subconscious programming is holding our beliefs, right? In our mind, we have memories. This is another layer of who we are, right? So we are both conscious and unconscious at the same time. This all matters. When we're trying to figure out ourselves and heal from codependency, this all matters. But unfortunately, but I do think it's changing. But unfortunately, so many of us, when we go into therapy, what is focused on is the output. What, what a therapist might focus on is our anger or a fo uh, they might focus on our marital problems or it might focus on our anxiety or our depression. But what we have to focus on is the why. Because anxiety and anger and codependency, these are symptoms of something much, much deeper. And the beautiful process that we're on is one of self-actualization because you are so fortunate, so fortunate if you are waking up and realizing what's wrong is that I'm codependent. My mood is dependent upon other people, right? My sense of self is dependent upon something or some experience or someone outside of me. Oh my God, I don't feel enough unless I'm doing this thing or I'm having this experience, right? Or I'm gaining this validation. You know, um, we can be, one of, the, one of the amazing things about coming from a dysfunctional home is that we are amazing multitaskers most of the time. Some of us hit a wall and then we become great procrastinators. But for the majority of the time, many of us have incredible 
um, triaging skills. Like if, if, if the wall's falling down, make sure an adult child of an alcoholic is going in because they're going to be able to put their emotions aside and figure out what has to get done, right? How many of you can relate to that? Like when, when the shit hits the fan, you are the hero, right? You are the one who's like, I got this, right? Because we're so used to shunting our emotions. We're so used to worrying about everybody else, right? So it's not a, that's a pretty good thing. That's one thing that comes out of being, you know, the adult child of, a, of an emotionally abusive home. You end up being a wonderful multitasker when needed. That's awesome. But, you know, there, there are other things that happen to us along, along the way, too. Like this shunting of our emotions keeps us stuck. And these, the fear of being able to access our emotions, right, and being able to deal with them in a healthy way is avoided. And we avoid it through taking care of other people. We avoid it by staying busy. Some of us can be highly, highly, highly intellectual, you know, um, and when we're highly intellectual, that's awesome. But if you're not integrated emotionally and we're not, and you don't have emotional intelligence, then you can walk around and feel very, very empty in your life. Or you can be over emotional where you know, everything is upsetting to you. And, you know, you're not able to um, be able to think about things more rationally, right? You know, everything is triggering for you. We don't want that either. So, you know, very oftentimes we will be either in a, we're stuck somewhere. We're either very reactive or we're dissociating, right? And when we're reactive, we end up inducing spirals of shame, right? So we're upset that we got upset and it's just a mess. And so it's a wonderful thing to wake up and realize that you're codependent because now you have at least some understanding of where you can go with this information, right? So many people are dying not knowing what was really wrong, never even hearing the word codependency, never even contemplating this idea of abandonment trauma or attachment trauma, not even knowing if not even considering that their childhood is affecting who they are today or what their behaviors are, right? And so I'm so glad that you're here. I just wanna see if somebody has the hand. I'm gonna jump right in. Camille, you have your hand raised. Hi, Lisa. How I are don't you? know if that, oh, I'm great. And, and I'm really great since I discovered you. Yay. You really helped me so much understand that I wasn't alone. Correct. And, and what one suffers through when one realizes one had narcissistic abuse. Yes, Because ma'am. I didn't see that until I was older and got, was able to break away from the person who would be the mother. Oh, I had wow. for a while, like, because I moved far away. And I, then I came back to my hometown and got back in and saw just how it's actually progressed now where she's worse than she was. Yeah. Um, she has to yeah. keep a truth and lie journal to keep up with how she's gaslighting you. Oh, you poor thing. That's yes. I'm just, I know that for myself, I didn't realize I, I could, since I studied some psychology and I had been to a therapist, mm-hmm. I kind of got a general idea that I wasn't crazy. Mm-hmm. But I also did, I was like you, no one could tell me. They didn't ask, well, gee, um, was your parent like this? Oh. Everybody coddled her like she, you know, you were just supposed to do as she said. My father was really abused by her because he was a pleaser. You yep. know, he wanted to please, make your mother happy, do what she says. Wow. And I really feel for him um, just because I, I can see now how she abused him mm-hmm. and how she really abused him. You know, me and my sister more than my little brother. Yeah, you know, absolutely. She has her darling. Mm-hmm. But you're so wonderful, and I love you, and everything you say is right. And I thought I was waving and putting my hand up going agree, and I didn't realize I had my fa- my hand up to ask a question. Oh, no, but no problem. Say thank you, you have- so much. You're wonderful. No, thank you so much. You know, it's just, um, you know, I share what I've been through because I realize, like, so many people are struggling with this, it's so much more common than we realize. And, you know, if if we're going to therapists and counselors, and I'm not putting them down because there are, listen, the, the right therapist turned me on to codependency. They do exist. 
but you know if we if we're going to doctors with depression and anxiety you know and they're not trauma informed right um, they're not trauma informed doctors then they're not going to ask us tell me a little bit about your childhood what did you experience did you feel seen were your did, were your emotions validated you know were they were they validated or invalidated right um you know, did you feel like you had a, a good relationship with your mom or was it abrasive? These are really important questions because the way our, especially our moms, but the way our parents viewed us is the way we end up viewing the self. So if mom can't love me, there's a point in our life where we are blaming ourselves for that. Um, and this follows us the rest of our lives. So. You know, I'm so grateful that you're here. I'm so grateful that you figured it out. It's so wonderful to know that you're not crazy. You know, isn't it awesome? It is awesome. And since listening to you, I, I realized that that is why I chose my husband. Oh, the person okay. I married because it was like another her. Yeah, and then yeah. some people that I've had to let go as, quote, friends because they were actually another her. Mm -hmm. And I can see it now. I'm like, oh, my God, I was actually making myself crazy. <laughs> you know, you know, what happens is, you know, it's, it's so amazing because it all fits into even the law of attraction, because, you know, um, every cell in our body is tuned up for this energy. Right. This is all we knew. Our, our parents had a particular energy, you know, um, and we can't tell the difference between familiar and attraction, which is basically the same thing. So what, what is familiar is attractive. And so, and we have to also understand that until we heal this attachment trauma and abandonment trauma, you know, our body cells, our psychology is looking to fulfill this attachment trauma. We're looking to finally feel um, safely attached, which we never felt. And so it's, it's really important that we recognize that the brain likes the familiar and what is familiar, we will consider attractive and we will be attracted to the familiar. Um, and that is why it's so important to gain, gain a hold of the, our childhoods and see how it plays into our adult life so that we move through life more consciously rather than unconsciously. Exactly. You've really helped me so much. I look forward every day to what you write and listen to what you have to say because it really resonates with me I can really get so much out of it and I want to thank you so much and thank you for having this webinar oh yeah sure no no problem thank you thank you so are you a part of our Facebook group yes ma'am awesome awesome all right well I'm so glad that you're here thank you for raising your hand it was lovely to speak to you I'm gonna, I'm gonna take it down I thought I was just waving oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> hello no problem Bye Bye now. Well, thank you Thank you. Okay, so we're going to, so Karen, um, I'm not so sure Karen has, so we're going to go to Kat. Hello. Hi, Kat. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good. Very good. Nice to speak to you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I've sort of come up against, <clears throat> sorry, the, the same thing again and again, which is I know what I'm meant to do. I Now, because of you, I know the clear path that I need to take mm -hmm. uh, after many years of looking um but I feel like part of me is not willing to let go of the negativity to let go of the past and what keeps coming up for me is that I've never spoken like honestly to my narcissistic dad I've never told him how I feel or anything like that mm -hmm. and I, I feel like I want to say something to him in order to let the past go and do the recovery work I need to do. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had a thought about um, not confronting a parent, but, but just speaking your truth to a parent. So that's a great question, you know, um, and I had to face it myself. So one of, you, one of the things that you, that um, you want to be, you want to understand before you confront any narcissist is that, they are wired to reject you, yeah. right? So um, narcissists do not think that they're a problem. And when you, they see themselves as the largest victim in the world. So when you say to them, you hurt me, immediately mm -hmm. their, defense, their defenses go up. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, what happens then is that they have to annihilate you. Mm. So if you think it was bad before, it's going to be <laughs> worse. Mm. Right. So, so, but I do understand in, first of all, le, you know, letting go, um, I, I even use that term letting go, but it's really true. So it's, it's, we have to acknowledge what has happened and, you know, it just doesn't happen like that. And, you know, what, have, what I found on my recovery journey was that so much of what was wrong was subconscious. Mm. So much of what was wrong was my automatic thinking. You know, the brain is, um, is, is stores behavior and, you know, the brain is like a maze. And so we think thoughts all day, every day. And we have these neurological pathways that, um, are, that, that are a mirror to, um, the way that we think. And this is all below the veil of consciousness. So, so much of what we have to heal is subconscious. You know, in my class, in the 12 week class, I have 13 meditations, right? All designed to get to the root of what's really keeping you stuck. However, when it comes to, that's why, you know, when people say I should let it go, it's, it's, what are you letting go of cat? Right? So what you're letting, what you think you want to let go of is the past, but can you let go of something that you don't own? No. So, so what that means is that we've got to help you somehow um, wrap your mind around what happened, you know, and for you to be able to take a true inventory of what was lost, right? And once you really, really know what was lost and what, the, what this cost you, then you're able to look at it and then you can let it go because now you own it. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes, you know, being raised by a narcissist, we don't even realize what the cost was because it was mm -hmm. our norm. We don't even realize it. Right. So we, we, we behave certain ways and we don't even realize it's related to having a narcissistic death. So in your case, um, what's what what is what is one of the ways being having a narcissistic dad? How has that affected your adult life? Um, I mean, my relationships with men have been really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, Give me an example. I, yeah. I mean, my relationship with my body, like, I, I relate to your experiences that you've shared. Like, mm -hmm. one comment that he made, I feel like it changed the entire course of my life. Like, he said, you know, you're, you're not thin enough. No man will ever want you. And mm -hmm. I just took that as the truth. Yep. And... I manifested that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so that's, yeah. that's not your fault. Right. Right. And so um, it's what we want to do is teach you and teach everybody to learn that what comes out of a narcissist's mouth is their reality, mm. not the reality of everyone else, because that's a very ignorant statement for him to make. Um, it, it is his reality. But sometimes, very oftentimes, narcissists are saying things to gaslight their children, to mm -hmm. have power over them. Very oftentimes, narcissists want their children to be insecure. It is their goal. If you're insecure, right, then that maybe had issues with women. You know, um, maybe he didn't he didn't want his daughter to have self-confidence, um, you know, and so making sh crippling you. Right. Um, makes it difficult for you to have confidence. And so it's important that when you're thinking about the things that, that your father has said to you over time, that you disidentify, that you understand this was, this was his reality. It's not the reality of every man out there. Mm -hmm. Thank heaven. This was <laughs> him, right. Um, and in addition, you know, when you really take a giant step back and, and think about, what kind of a dad would say that to their, his daughter? Mm. That'll help you dis disidentify from it as well. Well, you realize, wow, that was a really crappy thing for a father to say to his daughter. That's, so that helps you disidentify from it. That's very important. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so, but it's important that you, 
that you pay attention to the things that he has said and really you know if you get nothing else out of this webinar make sure that you take an inventory of how what he has said has affected your life yes and Very do you think and do you think there's value in sort of talking to him about that you know it's um you know i have a dad with very high narcissistic traits and you know he abused the crap out of my brother right my brother is a very insecure person right today even though he's like six foot tall he was a new york city police officer but he struggles he struggles especially with authority figures and i know where it came from when i was talking to my dad about it his response is i don't know why your brother's like that i was never cruel to him you know, I mean, I was always good to your brother. My jaw dropped. I'm looking at my father like, what are you talking? I was there. Yeah. What, 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 what? You know, like you called him a jackass every day. You smacked him upside his head. You called him a dope. You called him an idiot. You, know, you called him a moron. I watched you, you know, throughout his whole life. So I don't think that us talking to our parents about our wounds and trying mm -hmm. to hold accountable um, is going to net us relief. Um, I think if you need to get this out of your system, then I think you write letters as, as, if, you're, as if you're writing it to your dad. You yeah. let it all out and then you read it once or twice and then you burn it or you just hold on to it. You know, mm. um, another thing that you can do is, you know, you can sit in a chair, put a chair in front of you and put a stuffed animal there, a pillow, whatever it is, a picture of your dad, and imagine that you're telling him exactly how you feel and let it rip so that you tell him and you get it out of you. Um, mm. How I deal with my dad now, because I've reconciled it, is you know, when he says something, um, I'll, you know, one time he said, um, I didn't want my children to be conceited. I didn't want them to have big heads. So I've learned to be sarcastic. So I said, well, it worked. You know, you did a very good job at raising three crippled children who hated themselves, thought they were the worst children in the world, had every eating disorder under the sun. You know, congratulations, you got exactly what you wanted. You know, so yeah. I've learned to deal with him that way. But my advice is, you know, unless you're unless you're ready, really, really ready for the consequence of confronting a narcissist, I'm not so sure I would especially if you're early on the healing journey. Mm, yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. just being real, I'm just being real with you because let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What do you hope to gain from confronting him? I, I think I just want to open my mouth because yeah, I mean. there's been so much silence around his behavior my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I just want to open my mouth and show him or show myself that I'm not yeah. a victim. Wonderful. I think, you know what? I think if you are, if he says something to you, right, in the moment, it, mm. oh, I had a showdown with my mom like that too. You know, she, uh, it was, I talk about this in one of my videos. It was my, it was my birthday and I was going through the divorce and I was so tired and we had pizza on paper plates and we had coffee mugs, you know, ceramic coffee mugs. My sister-in-law was cleaning the mugs and I made the mistake of saying, I'm so tired. And my mother looked at me, she said, I don't know what you're so tired for, blah, blah, blah. You didn't raise an effing finger the whole time you're here or freaking finger the whole time you're here. And I just, she said it in front of my ex-husband cause she invited him. She said it, she wanted to embarrass me. This was the thing that she did. And I remember asking myself, like, how do I feel? And I just started to cry. And I called my kids in, they put their jackets on and she came in the back room, where are you going? And I pointed my, pointed my finger in her face and I said, I'm not 12 anymore. You don't mm -hmm. get to talk to me like this anymore. If a girl ever needed her mother, it was now. Mm. Even though it wasn't a big deal, I knew that she knew what she was doing. Yeah. I knew that she knew what she was doing was going to make me feel bad for daring to mention I was tired. I shared an emotion. Not allowed to do that in my house. Got to suck yeah. it up. Don't you yeah. dare act like you're a victim. Don't you dare act tired. Your father and I can be tired. You can't be tired. 
<laughs> so um, you may want to, if you if he says something and he rattles your cage, you know, you might want to bark back at him, but just be prepared for that you might have to leave the house or be prepared mm. for whatever he says. It might get so bad that you're like, you know what, I'm done, I'm out of here. But maybe you need yeah. that. So if you're waiting for him to like say something, you might want to bark back. He might he might be shocked, you know, but we don't confront narcissists because we expect them to hear us. That's just unrealistic. Yeah, if you want, no, I, I think I think it was more for my sense of like, I'm saying this to you. OK, well, give yeah. me give me a, an idea of the kinds of things that he says to you that upsets you. Oh, I don't know. Mm. He, he, I don't know, because I have barked back at him a bit as I got older. I think he says stuff less, but it's yes. more just the kind of historical stuff. Like, you know, yeah, like he'll say little jibes or something. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, just be prepared, Kat. Like when you say something, um, I remember my my when my daughter was going to Italy for school and my father has this weird thing about money. Like he asks everybody how much they make, how much that it's none of his damn business. And um, you know, he said to my daughter, Oh, you're going to Italy, who paid for that? And I barked at him and I said, Well, you didn't, and you're not paying for it, so why do you care? Mm. And he just looked at me, he goes, Well, is is I didn't come here to get irritated, and I said, Neither did we. But you're not paying for it. Why do you care? Mm. So, so just that thing in the moment, like cutting it dead. Yes, yes, yes. So mm -hmm. and 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 what's happened over the years is that he knows, like, oh, don't start with your sister, you know, because I finally learned to like bark back. That's mm. not who I am. I don't like being that way, but I know with him, if I'm not that way, he's not gonna stop. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, mm. just be prepared. another another thing that um I've said to him is why would you say that? You know, like I remember one time he said something about my mother's wrinkle. You know, she had a wrinkle on her face. He goes, oh, if you just had a little tuck here, that's the kind of crap you did. You know, mm. after she worked all day, you know, delivering mail in the cold, if you just did a little tuck here, you know. Yeah. And I remember looking at looking at him and going, why would you say that? And yeah. he didn't. He was dumbfounded. Well, I'm just kidding. I'm like, well, that's not very nice. Yeah. I think and it's so, like the whole narcissistic thing. Sometimes it like takes you a few hours to realize what they've said. Absolutely. Like if, if I push back with him and like hold my power, mm -hmm. like as I'm leaving, he'll be like, oh, are you OK for money at the moment? Like, oh, my God, I love bombing you. Well, no, no, like saying like you can't look after yourself. Oh, like you no. need, you know, yeah, like oh, you probably haven't got enough money, so if you need any, just ask. Not mm. that I would, but right. that kind of thing. And it takes you, and you think, oh, he's being nice, and then you're like, no, he's not. No, no. So what you, you know, any if you know that money is one of his one of his hooks then whenever he brings it up, you have to say, everything's great. Yeah. No, no, everything's I'm fine. great. I'm thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for, oh, thanks for asking. It's so kind of you, but I'm doing great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Another, another thing that, that um, <clears throat> another trick that I've learned over the years dealing with people who, you know, are intrusive, you know, like to play those little mind games is if they call you and they say, how are you? You immediately ha don't give them any personal information. Throw it mm -hmm. back in the court. How are you? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, we were wondering how you were feeling. I'm fine. I'm wondering how you're feeling. You know, mm -hmm. what are you what are you going to do on Saturday? I'm not sure yet. What are you going to do on Saturday? Mm -hmm. Pushing it, always pushing it back into their court because their brain will fart like they don't know how to. <laughs> They don't know how to deal with someone who is not dancing, you know, because they like to gaslight you and mm. they they know what your buttons are. So if your buttons is your weight, if your button, your button is money, if you know, my, those are all my buttons. But also, you know, implying that, you know, I was too much for a man. I was too emotional for a man. My father mm. used to like to, 
you know, uh, stick the knife in and, oh, well, you're always been too emotional. Gosh, so, that even triggers me here. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Ugh. So, you know, um, one time you said to me, oh, you're too sensitive. And I was like, mm, I think you're insensitive. Yes, good. I like that. You yeah. Know, so, so it's really, so it's beyond, beyond expecting him to hear me. It's just not, oh, this is, this is who I am. You're over there. This is how I am. This is how you are. I know who you are, you know, and this is what the way it's going to be from now on. So if you bark, I bark, you know, if you ask me a yeah. question, I'm asking you a question and it's like a really amazing feeling. Yes. Yes. And the few times that I have like pushed back, mm -hmm. it feels like I get this rush of energy that goes up my body and it's like, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, good. Awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, good for you. Yeah. Thank good. you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. Bye. Take care. Hopefully, Cody. Hi, Cody. Hi there. Can you Hi, hear me? Cody. Yes, I can. Okay. So I, I'm, I'll try to get through this without getting too stressed out or panicked or all of those other words. I'll try to help you. Am still married. Okay. It just sort of recently in the last several months came to the aha moment. I mean, I knew something was off. Okay. Because I, I couldn't fix it and I kept trying to fix it. Okay. So I just sort of recently recognized and I'm trying not to screw this up. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm definitely screwing it up. Okay. Um, I, I finally had to ask him to leave a couple of days ago because it's just been too much recently. Okay. I think because I've called him out on things that I shouldn't have. I did okay. the thing that you just said not to do. Right. Right. I mean, I haven't said, oh, you're a narcissist, but I've just said, this is, re well, I don't understand what's happening. I called right. him out on gaslighting, on lies, those kind of things. Okay. I mean, okay. we've been married almost, almost 20 years. Right. Okay, 20 years. Okay. Any uh, children? Six. Six kids. Okay. Blended, fam you? blended family. Okay. I had three. He had three. We've raised all six under one roof. Okay. Um, they're all, I say, adults over 18 now. Okay. There's a significant age gap between me and my husband. He's 15 okay. years older. Okay. Okay. So the, the kids are, uh, there's a gap between mine and his. Right. Okay. And now he's not living in the home anymore? Well, I wouldn't say not living. Okay. A, a couple of weeks ago, I found out because that he was planning on moving out and he okay. didn't mention it to me. So I finally just said, you know what? I think it's a great idea. Why don't you, All I right. need some space to calm down. I've uh, started Zoloft for depression a few months ago. My anxiety is through the roof mm -hmm. and he just keeps, he knows my buttons and he keeps pushing yeah. them multiple times a day. And sure. I feel like I'm going crazy. That's I'm doing things that are not me. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm just not myself. So, so what kinds of things is showing up for you? Um, like how am I feeling? Like, yeah. Like, like, how are you feeling? Um, I, right, right, right now I'm shaking like a chihuahua. Okay. My heart is racing. All I right, mean, so why, kind of, why don't we do this, Cody, right? Why don't you take a nice deep breath in? Just take a nice deep breath in. Just relax your shoulders. Connect with your breath. Let's just connect with your breath. Let your mind go. Your amygdala is highly activated. That's That makes sense. Just breathe in and just connect with your breath. Only a calm mind can take a deep breath. So what you want to do, make sure that you, as you're falling asleep, as you're going about your day, you're being mindful of taking deep breaths. That is the quickest way to relax the amygdala. Okay. okay. So you want to make sure that you're mm -hmm. just constantly connecting with your breath. That's the, because where you are, who you really are is connected to your breath. It's in silence. Right. That's who you are. What's, we have to see ourselves as multidimensional human beings. So we have a spirit self, we have a brain self, we have an unconscious mm -hmm. self, we have a reactive self, we have a hormonal self, mm -hmm. um, we have a child self, we have the adult self and self and all this bullshit now we got to do.
deal with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we're multidimensional. So we want to make sure that, you know, we, you are, you are obviously highly activated in terms of the amygdala. And mm -hmm. if you're living with someone who enjoys gaslighting you and making you question yourself, mm -hmm. then it's going to be very important for you to learn to like slow yourself down, mm -hmm. really just slow yourself down. So, um, what is your biggest concern at the moment with him? I, I know divorce obviously is inevitable, okay. but I need to I need to get myself into a place where I can think clearly to okay. be able to make make those steps. Right. Okay. Okay. So because I don't I don't feel like that's happening for me right now. Yeah, it's clear, I think, clear thought. Yeah. How long is he? So he's is he he's out of the house? Right. I asked him to leave on Mother's Day. When was that? Sun Sunday. Oh, so it's only a few days. It's going to take a right. while. You know why? Because the thing, Cody, you know what it is? You probably feel like prey around him, right? Right. I mean, he's texting me multiple times a day, finding ways to make sure he sees me every day. I and so it. today, uh, today I finally, I, I text my therapist, which I've been in therapy for seven years, and nobody has said, well, I think there might be something wrong with your husband. I'm They've so just sorry. My first therapist said, you need to give him sex when he wants it. You need to submit to your husband. Wow. It's, it's been a really rough road. Anyway, I'm so sorry. I, I text my therapist this morning and I said, I, I asked for space because I said I needed to work on myself because I am too highly activated. My mm -hmm. body is freaking out. I can't eat. I've lost 10 pounds in a week. This is mm -hmm. not okay. No, it's not. Okay. I, I didn't. I didn't push it off on him. I just said I need. Good. I tried not to make it his fault. I, mm -hmm. I said I need this, Great. but I, he's he's not giving me space. He's calling. Right. He's stopping by. He's texting. She right. said, "Tell him, tell him that you appreciate that he is being thoughtful by texting and calling by calling, but the behavior in the last few weeks has gotten me very overwhelmed." And would it be okay if I got some real alone time space for a while? Um, now, what has I, he been doing the past three weeks? Oh, it's it's been unbelievable. Just the small little insidious yep. stuff that maybe a couple years ago I could have handled better. Yep. But I'm I literally do. not handling anything. Yeah. When I, Anything. when I finally, when I finally decided to leave my ex-husband, I, I was hitting a wall. I thought I was going to die. I, I am thinking um, if this continues, I will be dead. Yeah. I, mean, I can't that survive like this. That was my thought. And it was like, you know, I wish I could say that it was like, I woke up and said, you know, my relationship's really unhealthy. It's, we should mm -hmm. really, divorce. no, it was asthma, migraine headaches, mm -hmm. ulcers, um, rashes that they thought was cancer. I got tested for cancer. They didn't know what was happening. Um, my hair was falling out. I blew out my thyroid. I was oh shaking all the time. That's exactly uh, what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I totally hear you, girl. And the good news is you're not crazy. You're just unhappy. It feels you know? that way. I understand. On, on, when you're dealing with, it's important that right now your body is overcome it's overwhelming you what your the, your body sensations right um and this might sound sound weird but if you could just take a deep breath and recognize mm -hmm. that your body is actually behaving correctly mm -hmm. you know the shaking mm -hmm. the anxiety your body is actually behaving the way it's supposed to behave when someone feels unsafe you feel unsafe, correct? Correct. Yeah. You feel unsafe. You don't trust your husband. Correct. Yeah. You feel unsafe. When 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 a dog doesn't feel safe, it shakes. Mm -hmm. So the shaking that you're experiencing is actually normal and it's valid. So if you could just take a deep breath and you can let your body know, send your body the signal like, I know why you feel this way. Okay. Because your body has got to respond 
to your emotional self and your emotional self is responding to your reality. And when you, I'm sorry, but it's, it's just true. When you have therapists that say, you just give them sex, where do I fit in? When I was when I was with that therapist, he was having an affair, and I didn't even know it. Wow. Two two years after I started seeing her, I caught caught him with a Craigslist hooker. Wow! So you have grounds for divorce. I mean, and that wasn't the first time he had been doing it for thirteen years, apparently. Yeah. Uh, STD. Okay. It's there's a long list, but I didn't feel this bad when that happened, and I. Yeah, I'm finding it difficult to understand. I think maybe maybe it's just understanding that he's just a black hole of nothingness. Yeah, you know, it's feels, it's hard. feels worse than all the affairs. Oh, well, I think what happens is that you know, when when our mind is coming face to face with the reality that we're living with somebody who behaves like a predator. It's scary. Mm -hmm. When you're not sure that you're dealing with this, it's not so scary. And then when you start realizing, well, I don't want to live with this person the rest of my life, then your mind goes, well, how the hell am I going to get out of it? And then your mind goes, well, what's going to happen when I tell them I'm done? Huh. Right? So, so your mind, your mind is looking for a solution. Your mind, our mind is always looking for the end game. We've got to slow it down. Right. We have to slow it down. We've got to make sure that we're getting we are, our mind understands. I have to get through today. I have to get through this moment. Right. Know in your in your head where you want to go, which is well, where do you want to go? I don't even know. I mean, I, I've been trying to have an imagination about something and I, I, I can't get there. Right. I just I'm, I, I'm I just know. I just know that I can't do this. Right. That's what I knew. That's what I knew, too. Like, I don't know where I'm going. I just know I can't stay. Th th that's right. That's all I, I know. Didn't know. That's, which is a good thing to know, right? It's, it's, you're actually at a better place now, even though it doesn't feel like it, because now you're dealing with the reality of it, right? And that's why you're all, everything that you've ever stuffed is coming to the surface. Yeah, I so, said I said that to to my therapist the other day. I said I've been so good about putting everything in a box, putting yep. the lid on and packing it away, but now it's like all the boxes have been tossed. They're everywhere. Everything's all over the floor. I don't know where yep. anything is or where it goes. Yep, I hear you. Well, that's normal. You know, tell me a little bit about your childhood. What was your mother and father like? <sighs> oh, that's a lot of. Yeah, girl. Uh. uh my mother might be a narcissist as well. Mm -hmm. My sis, my sister was the golden child, though she had a traumatic childhood, but was fawned upon. Mm -hmm. um, sh she was an angry child. She was beaten up frequently. She was four years older than me. She, okay, so she cut cut herself. Mm -hmm. She was a cutter. Yeah. Um, alcoholic as a teenager, she had several suicide attempts. So there was a lot of attention on her and I just had to be like non-existent. Right. Okay. You know, makes... quiet, the good kid, the mm -hmm. don't need anything, make everything okay, make everybody happy. Well, you're having a spiritual awakening. I know it doesn't, it do, I know it doesn't feel like it, but that's what's happening you know, you're having a spiritual awakening and um, your spirit is awakening to the reality of the situation and your spirit's not having it. You know, uh, your true self is like, this is bullshit. You know, um, I don't like what's happened, but you have to also understand that you don't, you don't have the data for how to deal with reality. So you're kind of freaking out a little bit. You have, you know how to suppress and pretend but you don't know how to be, uh, does that resonate with you? Like you don't know how to be present mm -hmm. with the reality of what's going right. on. I, right? I think I sort so, of, so, yeah. that, that my, out, my outward has to be what's okay with everybody else. 
I'm not right. in, in, internally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter Outward, I yeah. mean, to anybody else that however I'm feeling internally has to stay there. No, it's not going to work anymore because you're 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 at a point now where you're going to have to start letting people know how you feel. Um, and that's a good thing. But it's almost like for people like you and people like myself, many people who get pushed up against the wall, you know, it's like Pandora's box. You know, it's like mm -hmm. our bodies can only hold so much. And then it's just like that one drop of water in the pool that makes the whole, oh, there goes my microphone, that makes the pool explode. That one, mm -hmm. oh, can't do it anymore. You know, and all, blah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's important. It's, it, I hope you hear what I'm saying. You're going to have to suspend your mind a little bit. What I mean is not control it so much. So meditation is going to be really important for you. Um, you're going to have to give your body permission to allow some of Pandora's box to come out of you. And that, that will happen with um, adrenaline. That will happen with cortisol. Your heart rate's going to get up. Your breathing is going to change. Um, you're going to feel anxious, right? Because you are at a point where you can't contain it anymore. And, and that's a good thing, but it's, it can be terrifying, right? Mm -hmm. So in a year from now, you're going to look back at this and say, my life was falling apart, but it was really falling together because this is an opportunity for you to change your paradigm, right? And so, um, well, I don't know if you guys will be able to see this, but I was working on paradigms the other day. So I don't know if you can you see this, Cody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Pretty, so, pretty much. So this is paradigm. This let's say this is paradigm A. So mm -hmm. that's the par that's the paradigm your mother and father created in you. Mm -hmm. Shut up. Be a good girl. We don't, we don't have don't, time for you. We don't have time for you. So you you have you have feelings about your sister's attempted uh, attempts on her life. You had feelings about her cutting. You mm -hmm. had feelings about her getting hit. Where mm -hmm. are they? You downloaded them. Your ethereal body, your emotional body, has got all these emotions locked inside. Not your fault. You know the energy that is supposed to be flowing through you isn't or wasn't. It was locked inside Pandora's box, and now you're at a point where the box can't contain the bats anymore the bats want out energy wants to flow energy mm -hmm. wants to flow that's what's happening but mm -hmm. so your parents created paradigm a and unfortunately that creates a paradigm in your adult life that you follow mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so right now cody is in a wonderful time for you to create paradigm c which means that you have to you have to be you have to um, be very allowing of how you feel. You have to know that how you feel is valid, you know, anxious and afraid and not knowing what to do next. You simply don't have the data for how to deal with this, how to confront how you feel, how to make yourself matter. You don't have the data for that. This is supreme codependency. This is, you know, battered wife syndrome, right? This is narcissistic abuse sy syndrome. Um, this is what happens to people who have been gaslighted, right? Um, your husband probably knows exactly what he's doing, texting you, mm -hmm. making sure he stays pretty close to you. Um, what jumps out at me is that just so you know clearly, you have grounds for divorce, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, any man that's done what he's done, but more than likely, you were still, your pain tolerance was so high that finding this stuff out and then shunting how you felt about it was your norm. So you were able to cope. But now. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. I mm -hmm. mean, that makes sense. My youngest daughter was getting braces that weekend that that happened. I still had, what, there was two kids in high school. It, you know, you're, you're probably right. Because I've just yeah. been sitting here going, I don't understand why now. Because the kids are older, and mm -hmm. you, you have you have less, and your spirit has feels less obligated to worrying about them. And 
on some level, there may, may be some awareness in you like now's the time. The kids are older, you know, you know, they're at it. We don't need him like we used to need him. Um, and now there's more time for me to process how I feel. You know, that's why lots of times anxiety shows up right when we hit right when we go to bed. Like, why am I anxious now? Because right. you're not taking care of the kids and you're not planning meals. You're right. trying to lay down, you know, not doing 300 things on your way to bed like usual. Right. So you're not crazy. This is very this is a very normal pattern for someone in your situation. Like it's happening now because I have less distractions. And on some level, you don't want to be with him the rest of your life, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. on, I, right. I, on some, go ahead. No, no. I mean, I, I'll be dead. There's no way I can. No. Right. Right. So if you no. go ahead and he doesn't want. I mean, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't want to spend time with me. He's no. I mean, he's well, mean. He's mean. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's. Why would any? Why would a woman? Why would a woman? How old are you? Do you know what I mean? Forty. Forty-four. Forty-four. Why would a forty-four-year-old woman? Right. Um. I'm just doing he, the math. He'll be sixty why, this year. Okay. Why would a forty? Makes sense to me why a 60 year old man would want to be with a 44 year old woman, you know. But why would a 44 year old woman who is married to someone 15 years her senior who has been on Craigslist, Craigslist with prostitutes more than once, why would this 44 year old woman want to spend another 15 years with this man? I have no idea. It, it, you don't want to, mm -hmm. right? So. No. It's it's important. So, you know, um, how are you feeling now? Are you feeling any less anxious? I am. I am. Thank you. Wonderful. That's awesome. And so um, it's important that you you pay attention to breathing mm -hmm. and um, validating yourself mm -hmm. and understanding why you feel the way you feel. Right. Um, make sure that you understand that you have a right to have an opinion about him. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. a right as a child. You didn't have a right to have an opinion. Right. So this is what I was just talking about earlier with cat. I believe about the subconscious programming, you know, um, I hope that you look into my class that begins this summer. I think that you're a perfect mm -hmm. candidate for it. Um, I will. Absolutely. So much of what's wrong is below the veil of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, I say to someone like you, do you know that you have a right to have an opinion about him cheating on you? And what happens in your mind? It goes to what does he think about me having an opinion about him cheating? On me? Right. Right. And mm -hmm. then what I would say to you is, OK, I get that. That's a codependent thought. So so then I ask you to go deeper. OK, but you know that you have, I just volley it right back. So you have a right to have an opinion about him having an affair on you and about him being mean. And it's totally fine. His opinion of you is, doesn't have to affect your opinion of him. They're completely mm -hmm. two different things, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. your mind has to be taught and reprogrammed, right? Because you have been programmed to worry about what mom thinks, what dad thinks what your sister right. thinks, what the kids mm -hmm. think. This is literally programming. Mm -hmm. Right. Know. Right. So know that you can reprogram your mind. You can. I did it. Right. And so um, it's imp I, I didn't get a divorce for years because I was worried about what my parents thought about me getting a divorce. Mm. I was sleeping with him. Right. I was washing his socks. <laughs> I was cooking his meals. I was dealing with it every day and I'm worried what everybody else thinks about me, what I think about my ex-husband, mm -hmm. you know, it was, right. I was programmed. That's living below the veil. So your mind has grooves, literal neural pathways that when I say to you, do you know that you have a right to have a, a, an opinion about how he treats you? And just stay there. Just stay there in that. Just stay in that space and say it out loud. I have a right to have an opinion about my husband cheating on me. 
Say it out loud. I have a right to have an opinion about my husband cheating on me. That's right. I have a right to have an opinion about how he treats me. I have a right to have an opinion about how he treats me. Mm -hmm. I have a right to have an opinion about this marriage. I have a right to have an opinion about this marriage. Right. How does that feel? It feels weird and it feels like I have to defend it honestly. Right. I mean, I want right. it to feel right. Right. Well, it's do can you okay, let me ask now I'm gonna to talk to your rational brain. Because okay. your your emotional brain is like, this doesn't feel right. And that's normal. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's not your norm. But so pull away for a second and let me ask you this. Do you think that a woman will take it off of you? Do you think a woman that has been married to somebody who's been on Craigslist, Greg's list, sleeping with prostitutes, do you think that that woman has a right to be upset with that man? Yes. Awesome. So if my ex-husband was on Craigslist and I caught him, you know, and I called you up and said, you're not going to believe this shit. You're not going to believe what I just found out, right? Would you believe that I had a right to be angry? Yes. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. So it's important that you understand that your level of awareness has to expand. Okay. Right? Right right now, your level of awareness, you know, Einstein says you can't solve a problem with the same the same level of intelligence that created the problem. Right, right. right. So what is you can't heal this problem with the same level of awareness. So you can't heal, you can't come at your marriage like a grown ass woman feeling like your four year old self. You've got to own, wait a minute, I'm not four. I didn't have a right to an opinion then to the way people treated me, but I have a freaking opinion now. I've raised right. six children. I know that me worrying about what he thinks about my opinion of him is wrong. I know that that's dysfunctional. That's speaking to your rational mind. Mm -hmm. Right? That, right, that registers. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So what we've just done in a very short amount of time is we've been able to calm your amygdala down, your, hip, your limbic system down mm -hmm. enough to the point where you were able to have a prefrontal lobe thought, a neocortex mm -hmm. thought, an executive decision was made, right? You said it registered, mm -hmm. yep. right? So we have the ability to use, and this is what my program is all about. We have the ability to use the prefrontal lobe. And when we think from the prefrontal lobe, we actually are able to harness the power of metacognition. You know that you can look at the way you think. You know that you can you can spend all night tonight writing it out a hundred times. I have a freaking right to my opinion. Mm -hmm. He can have any opinion he wants of my opinion. That does not have to land. That is irrelevant to me. Let him have his opinion of me. Let it stay over there. I'm going to stay in my own zone. I'm going to hold on to what I think about him. I'm going to hold on to what I think about him. That is you becoming you. That's beautiful. This is a great opportunity for you to find you and to honor you and to learn what it means to speak your truth. Now, when you're dealing with people like this, it, you have to be careful. It's not about getting them to validate you anymore. Right. No. So that's another program that has to change. This is not about him giving me permission to be on Zoloft. This is not about him giving me permission to feel anxious around him. Mm -hmm. I feel anxious around him. Mm -hmm. I am unhappily married. I don't like him. Mm -hmm. I feel afraid when I'm around him. That's how I feel. Now, what a narcissist will do is say, ah, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. It's all in your head. That's what he's going to do. You've got to be able to say, cut that off and say, he is allowed to have any opinion he wants of me. His opinion is his opinion. My opinion is my opinion of him. Okay. That so makes... that's, 
That's you owning how you feel. Can you see how that that works? Yes. Now, can you see the beauty that 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 of all of this? I, I see. I can see how that can stop some of what affects me when he communicates. Yes. Or when he's trying to push my buttons or when I'm stupidly trying to communicate with him when I shouldn't be or when just when those circular conversations start. Oh, crazy. It doesn't matter. Right. Oh. And Another I'm, I'm make, making notes so that I will read and I'll read this over and over and over and over. Amen, so sister. It sticks. Amen. Amen, sister. You just tell yourself you're getting a new mind. I, I, yeah, you're right. I am getting a new mind. The old mind doesn't work anymore. But there's, Cody, it's so important. There's nothing wrong with you. It's, it feels like there is. I, I'm trying to tell myself this is, this is just a process. I'm just going through a process. It's not you. It's your programming. It's me. It's my programming. It's not you. It's your programming. You have been wired to deny yourself, and you are denying how you feel. And your your emotional body just can't hold these emotions in. It's just too much energy, right? And so, it, it, it like I said, it's like Pandora's box. You stuff enough elephants in Pandora's box, they're gonna wanna fly out. Mm -hmm. Now, you're if you're you have to expand your awareness because your body is gonna feel very tense, right? Mm -hmm. You you have got to exercise this off. You've got to jog or walk or get a trampoline, you gotta shake this shit off, right? Um, while you are confronting the program, you have to say, no, I'm not having a crazy conversation. The conversation isn't, oh, it, oh, here it is, it's going round and round, not doing it anymore, not doing it anymore. You know, when, yeah, he wants, right. when he wants to talk to you, just say, you know, give him a few minutes, oh, and the minute you know it's going nowhere, I'm done, I'm done, I'm not talking to you. Why? We never get anywhere. We never get from point A to point B. I know what you're doing. This is word salad. Mm -hmm. This is word salad. I feel unbalanced. I feel insecure. I feel confused after I talk to you. That's not healthy. So I think the other thing, the more time you spend away from him, the better you're going to feel. I hope so. No, generally, just, that's generally that's the way it is, even when he's just gone on a trip or whatever. But it hasn't happened yet, and it's been three or four days. I think it must be because he's reaching out every day. Yeah. You know, the other thing that you can say to him is that, you know, listen, throw it on yourself. I'm I'm feeling very vulnerable, mm. and, and I, can't, I can't text you back. I'm doing everything I can to hold on to myself because – if you throw it, I, I did that plenty of times with my ex-husband. Like if he texted me, I said, I have a migraine headache. And they was like, okay, he left me alone. You know, so as right. long as I assumed, you know, my stomach's mm -hmm. bothering me. As right. long as I made it sound like I had the issue and it wasn't like rejecting him, he left me alone. Mm -hmm. So you might, maybe you can, you know, you know, I haven't slept, I need to sleep, I can't text you back. Or... I want to talk to you. Not today. I have a splitting headache. I, anything to give you space away from him, right? right? You know, your body will calm down. You know, um, you know, when you're around him and you feel triggered by him, that's good information. Mm -hmm. Because you're not supposed to feel that way around somebody. All right. You know, um, and um, it sounds like it sounds like what you need is you really need a lot of support as you move forward and follow through with whatever the next steps are. The most important thing right now is that you learn some life skills around being able to hold on to yourself regardless of what he says and what he feels. You have to learn to honor your opinions right now. Okay. I think Very you're right. Important. I've spent so much energy orbiting around him that I don't even know. Absolutely. Some of my own opinions. Absolutely, girl. Absolutely. You. Um, what can help you right now? Um, you know, if you you can go to audible.com and you mm -hmm. can listen to the free the book. They'll actually give you a free download of Codependent Now What if you sign up for their free trial. But mm -hmm. Codependent Now What has a whole bunch of like um, strategy steps to help you. Definitely okay. learning about codependency and about how how 
childhood trauma has affected you, you're going to, you have to, I always say this, you can't fix a hole in the wall you don't see. Mm -hmm. You have to know why you don't have an opinion. That's because you weren't allowed to have an opinion. Today, you have to know that you're allowed to have an opinion. That's going to help you back out of this. Right. Okay. Right. So I would write it out a hundred times. I'm entitled to mm -hmm. my opinion. I have an opinion. I have an opinion. Mm -hmm. And, and will. definitely look, look into my August class. I will. Are you part of our Facebook group? No, I'm not. Well, I oh. mostly because I generally stay away from Facebook because of my yeah. mother. Oh, I hear you. Well, um, let me see. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, I'm sure I, we have. A, go ahead. I've considered creating another account because I know there's a lot of a, a different Facebook account that my mother's not on because right, I know so there's I'm, a lot of different support resources there. Yeah, we will welcome you in with open arms. We have like over 10,000 okay. members in my my large group. Um, mm -hmm. But um, let us know because if you're going to come in because we screen the profiles. So, okay. you know, we'd have to we'd have to get you in that way. I will. I will. Well, take care of yourself, dear one. You got thank you this. So, thank you so much. You have no idea how much better I feel right now than I, I did before. Go have some chamomile tea. Do a nice mm -hmm. meditation. Turn your phone off. I will. And remember to connect to your breath. I will. I will. Thank you so All very right. much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye now. Bye. So this is, you know, um, this is true life stuff. You know, what we're what we deal with, you know, in terms of codependency. Um, and um, another reason for the webinar is to help everybody understand that the, the 12 week class that I created, you know, this is exactly what we deal with. We deal with um, the programming. Right. So Cody was so, so genuine and so open with what she's experiencing, you know, and like I said, we can't fix a hole in the wall. We can't see if you don't know that you are disowning your opinion when you're around a narcissist, you can't own your opinion. You have to learn what you're doing wrong so that you can fix it. That's the only way to do this, right? Um, you know, we've got to know how we have been affected and how our brain has developed certain beliefs and, and how the neural pathways in our brain have developed pathways that coincide with these beliefs and how they're affecting our adult lives. So we are literally children in giant bodies, right? Um, nobody has the right to, to, to have emotional ownership of us, but we feel like people do, whether it's our father, like Kat shared about her dad or Cody shared about her husband. We can sometimes feel like people have ownership over us. And that is a very clear sign that we are suffering from a codependency, a fear of what other people think right? Um, we feel trapped. We are stuck in unhealthy relationships. Healthy people recognize that their relationships are unhealthy and they own how they feel. And it's hard to believe somebody who is suffering from so much codependency. It's hard to believe that you can get to a point and you can feel so confident in yourself. You're like, I'm done. Like it's over. What do you mean? It's over. I, it's over. Like, I don't want to be in a relationship, this relationship anymore. It's just, it's suffocating me. It's, it's hurting me. And it's, I say it's over, you know? Um, what do you mean it's over? I said, it's over. It's hard to believe that we can stand up to a narcissistic dad or a narcissistic partner or a narcissistic mother and say, I'm done and feel confident. But that's where we need to go. And the good news is you can absolutely get there. It takes a while, you know, understanding how the brain is behaving, understanding that the body is just really, the body is just responding to the chemicals that are related to fear and stress and anxiety. So if the body's shaking, that's normal. If you're afraid and you're shaking, that's normal, right? If you feel like prey around an intimidating personality, that's normal. So judging your body or thinking, am I going crazy is unnecessary. A lot easier said than done, but meditation, connecting to your breath, speaking to people about what you're feeling, getting reinforced, getting the support so that you know I'm not crazy, being in a company, in a group of people 
that understands what you're going through, right? And so before I answer another few questions, let me just talk a little bit about the 12-week class. So we, we relaunch on August 15th. And so what happens is, and you know what, I'm really honored because every class we do, we have amazing breakthroughs. We've had people who are suicidal, people who um, have you know, had the most terrible things happen to them, domestic violence, the loss of life in their, in their own life, um, come through the class and learn about the brain and learn about childhood. You know, and they get the support. We have four or five Facebook moderators along with myself. We are in we are in the secret Facebook group and on the website every day answering questions, right? You have the support and the validation from your classmates, which is huge. Every Thursday, you get a specific lesson. You get a video lesson, you get a meditation that has been that has been recorded with brainwave therapies. So it helps you accept these new codes and these new programs. Even if you fall asleep, the meditations work. You get journaling prompts. You get homework. You get a weekly live stream. Um, this is every Thursday. You get a new lesson. The lessons build off of one another, right, which is phenomenal. And the first four weeks are called the awakening phase. You've got to learn what was wrong. You've got to learn about your brain. You've got to learn about your emotions. You've got to learn about, you know, what is happening in your body and how your mind develops certain beliefs when you were below the veil of consciousness and an impressionable young child and how that it's affecting you today. Amazing module. Module two is called accountability. That is where we learn to say, okay, what am I not doing right and what can I do to fix it? which is really awesome. So this is where you're learning about actionable steps. And the fourth module is called the Ascension module. This is where you're learning life skills. You just heard me talk to Kat and Cody just a little bit about life skills that they didn't have, right, before this simple webinar. So the program is full of strategy steps and full of hands-on tools that you can use to help you deal with the stresses in your life. We need life skills. If you came from a dysfunctional home, you have been cognitively arrested. And when you hit a wall in your life and you realize you don't have the life skills to deal with these stressors, that's when you start to freak out, right? Normal. Anybody in that situation would freak out. That is the way a normal human being responds to tremendous life stressors when they don't have life skills. What does that mean? That means you can be taught life skills. And if you have the patience, if you have the diligence, if you have the will, you have to really want this. There's no way that I could have healed my life if I didn't want to change my life. I wanted to change my life as much as I needed to breathe. Because once I realized I was programmed and I knew that I trained my children to be codependent, I was pissed. I was pissed. I was so unhappy and so stuck in my life and so sick that I thought, oh, my God, are these going to be my kids, my children? Are they going to be just like me one day? That terrified me. And I committed myself to do whatever I could to change. So the 12 week breakthrough coaching program is basically a roadmap out of the codependent mind. It is, it's going to help you with narcissistic abuse recovery. It's going to help you to recover from gaslighting. You know, it's going to help you recover from feelings of powerlessness, right? It's going to help you feel empowered. And it's going to help you subconsciously. And it's going to help you consciously create tools that you can use every day. Upon graduation, you get a certificate. And you also are allowed to be uh, funneled into my large 12-week breakthrough graduates group where members often recycle the program. Um, you are also able then at that point to take the Master Your Reality coaching program, which takes all the lessons that you learn in the 12-week and applies them to the quantum laws that govern this universe. And that's where life gets really exciting. You know, you're like, hmm, I figured this stuff out. And it's really amazing. You know, so um, um, check the program out, right? Um, because we're, everybody that's involved with my classes, myself and the moderators, we're committed to helping bring 
bring people through the veil. It's really a spiritually a spiritual evolvement that takes place, a self-actualization that takes place. And um, it's absolutely phenomenal. And um, I really hope that you consider it. So we do have a little bit more time. I'm going to, going to um, let me see. Let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. I'm looking for um, hands that were up. Hi, James. Hello, hi. Hi, James, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well, how are you? Very good, nice to speak to you. Yeah, nice to speak to you too. Um, yeah, I just have a, a bit of a question. So I um, I used to, I, I basically, um, I think I've got a basically a, a narcissistic dad um and then i'm not sure about my mom but she had some like abandonment trauma when she was a child okay so um and now like so she used to say things when i was a a kid like oh you'll be the death of me if you don't do these things and you who's going to look after you then and things like that so i was i used to have a lot of um kind of a, like a uh, attachment problem i think of course guilt <clears throat> Yeah, and just, uh, you know, um, is it the uh, different attachment styles, like um, the anxious attachment style? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now, like, now that I'm an adult, when I have, like, kind of, <clears throat> when I'm going into a relationship or something like that, I, um, if if I feel like someone's withdrawing or something like that, I um, get, like, massive anxiety, panic attack kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um so yeah i just uh i'm not really sure i'm I'm sure it's related to that and it's not really about the person in front of me at the time it's more just um some sort of trauma or something i'm absolutely. not sure absolutely it absolutely is trauma so you know when we have these types of experiences with our our mother this creates um an attachment trauma and we're afraid of abandonment, right? And so yeah. that's our, and your mother is basically threatening you with abandoning you, which is the worst thing that a mother can do to a child. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. Right? So, so when you were little, right, you're wired to fear abandonment. Yeah, basically. I, I was always felt like, you, like you say, I was in this um, state of a uh, sort of, um, survival kind of absolutely well because you know it, it's just it's nature you know um if you look at animals and you and you look at in most cases not in all cases but in most cases the mother is taking care of the the baby animal whether it's you know a, a lion or if it's a bear you know even birds you know the mothers are the ones taking care of and nurturing this little baby right and so they are what we consider survival. Without them, we're not gonna survive. And the brain is wired for survival. And so this connection to our mothers is absolutely crucial, right? And you know, just because scientists can't peel it apart on a Petri dish, we know and they value, they'll tell you, scientists will tell you that the quality of the nurturing of a mother to a child is equal to um, how well the child will be able to nurture the self in the future. And so if there was an insecurity, if mom played mind games, right, to get you to feel insecure because she felt like she could control you or she for some reason enjoyed making you question, you know, whether or not she was always gonna be there for you, you know, your brain is wired to believe that the answer is attachment. So your brain associates pleasure with attaching and pain with abandonment. Right, now, yeah. That can turn anyone into an obsessive clinger because you have to understand that your brain is, is your autonomic nervous system is, is wired to work in tandem with your beliefs. So if there is an unconscious belief that or an unconscious attachment, right? And that, or there's pain associated with abandonment, you have to know that there's pleasure associated with attachment. So now in a relationship, someone starts to pull away, you don't feel enmeshed, 
all the alarm bells go off in your brain. Yeah, absolutely. So and then, and, and then you're motivated, your brain, right? What does your brain know to do? Cling. It's a very simple pro. It's a very simple um, process that we have to gain some conscious awareness over. Yeah, but I feel like it's like you, like you say about the amygdala. It just goes off, and it's like you can't Absolutely. really control it. So it's like, right. so what? Do you know what's the kind of solution to this? Is the is the way out of this sort of? You know, I hate to keep saying it, James, but my twelve week class would be per perfect for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, because it's not, you know, people want, this is not a quick fix. Anybody that tells you this is a quick fix, it's wrong. Because if this is an autonomic response. When, you know, after my divorce, the first person that I got involved with, when I think back to my state of mind at the time, it's horrible. I feel so bad for the young mom that I was after my separation because there was such a loss there, right? And I associated pain with separation that I attached and clung to the first person that showed me any interest after my divorce. Worst, one of the worst people I ever could have attached to at all, but it was an autonomic response to abandonment. There was a space there and I didn't know what to do with that space. It was, t I just had to fill that space, right? Um, and it was an autonomic and automatic response. I was not in control, James. Yeah, I was exactly. not. Yeah. I was not in control. And when I think about that, that scares the hell out of me, because I had three kids, and I would even, you know, be driving thinking I shouldn't be feeling this way, but I do, you know. Well, yeah, and absolutely, yeah. It's it's I, almost like yeah, it just triggers, and then it's like. Absolutely. It's a drug. Panicking. Yeah, it's like a withdrawal kind of thing. Absolutely. You know, and I remember I was mopping. I always tell this story, but I remember I was mopping and it hit me. <gasps> I crave him. And when I dropped the mop. I was like, I'm addicted. I'm a, this is this is because when you're addicted, you don't have any control. Right. So your brain has developed a need for this alcohol or whatever it is, cocaine, whatever, pain medication, right? And reason, logic and reason goes out the window. Your rational brain is bypassed. Your body, your physiology has taken over. Your autonomic, service, uh, an autonomic nervous system has been taken over. Now your behaviors have been taken over. It, you have left the building. And so when there is attachment trauma, it's the same thing because every cell in our being is craving this attachment which we were supposed to achieve and yeah. as as adults we have to understand the pain versus pleasure principle you have to know james you have to know rationally like wow if i get close to somebody and they start to pull away my brain is going to get triggered i'm going to want to cling no boy no good no, definitely. Your brain needs new data. Your And you know what happens? This is what happens, right? We're the nicest people in the world. We start to feel someone pull away. And what do we do? We push. Now, when you push, what happens is the other person feels you pushing. They get, they get kind of freaked out and they want to pull away, right? And so, and then they pull away some more and then we push some more. So, it's actually uh, we're self-sabotaging and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our fear of abandonment has come true. Basically, because, yeah. And it's also, I feel it's like this love addict, love avoidant kind of thing where absolutely. I'm kind of attracted to these people that I, I, it's almost like I want to see someone pulling away for me to think, oh, this is like, you know, this is what I, I, I that means I'm really attracted to them or something. But really it's some sort of, uh, yeah, it's this trauma thing again. I don't know. Yeah, it is. So what's happening is what's it's you're not doing anything. It's not your fault. So what's happening is you are attracted to the same type of energy being that wounded you in the first place. Right. That, okay. And that's not your fault. Right. And so all you're trying to do is gain the connection from that energy being it's almost like a milestone that your psychology and your biology knew you didn't meet. 
So it's like I'm trying to fix the, the, the past or something with it. Correct. You're trying to meet that milestone. The problem is that's autonomic. That's the problem. The problem is you have to gain some, some conscious awareness around it. You've got to raise your level of awareness so you recognize that, right? Um, yeah. And then you'll start to pick different people and then you'll start to behave differently. I, once I, I think... think yeah, I think it's maybe just the, the whole thing altogether. It's like this whole codependence thing. And just um, so I, I read a lot about, you know, um, like Pia Melody uh, mm -hmm. her things. And um, I'm seeing this therapist that's um, trained by Pia Melody's uh, post-induction therapy. Right. So, um, yeah, I, was, I think that's helping a bit. But, um, yeah, like I'm also sure maybe your program together with it would help. So. Yeah, I mean, that's what I've heard, you know, and I've had plenty of people that, that have, you know, either either gone through Pia's, Pia's um, program themselves or have been have been worked with one of their therapists and they love the class. You know, I think it's so important, James, and I really do think mental health is going to move in this direction, maybe 100 years from now. But I don't think that we can ignore the subconscious aspect of attachment trauma. For much longer so my my program addresses the subconscious programs um, because that's really what's going on here you know we're only five percent conscious so our beliefs are always going to win out over our conscious mind because our beliefs are unconscious and our patterns of behavior are unconscious so we have to address what's, what is subconscious, the ideas that were created in us when we were small around the fear of this person withdrawing from us. And this idea that if they're withdrawing, that means I'm bad and I just have to be better. No, no, you are enough. And if you're in a relationship, you wanna make sure you're holding on to yourself and you're not recreating your childhood, looking for an opportunity to gain the validation from an energy being that's similar to mom, you probably don't want an energy being that's similar to mom. No, definitely not. <laughs> right, right. So once you, again, once you gain some, some conscious awareness, because very oftentimes codependents settle for what shows up. You like me, good. You know, that's, we just settle for what shows up. You know, we're really not asking ourselves, is this person really compatible with me? Is this really the person that I want in my life forever? We're not even thinking. We just feel an attraction and we go, right? And then when that person starts to pull away, we push more. And then when we get sick of chasing them, we pull away and then they start coming back. That's yeah, generally, basically, yeah. It's no good, no good, no good. There's something so much better, so, something so much better. Um, but you're definitely on the right track, you know, but I think it's important that when, when you said, I, you said something like, um, I think I'm trying to, or this is so unconscious, James, it's ridiculous. Yeah, basically. And it, it's basically just screwing me up because like I'm now 32 and just, I feel like I can't, the only relationship I've ever been in is with someone that was basically borderline personality disorder and right. that, that didn't go so well so like um right now yeah, it's, 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 just... it's time it's time and I think it's I think it's wonderful that you're so aware you know and you're understanding you know I think it's I love being alive now because we're we're asking different questions than we were 20 or 30 years ago we're, we're understanding that trauma is affecting the adult self we're understanding how my relationship with my mother is affecting my relationship with whoever I'm attracting into my adult life now. I married my mother. My first husband was my mother's emotional twin. He would not give me validation. The more I needed it, the less he gave it to me. It was a carbon copy of my relationship with my mom. Didn't go so right. well. Yeah, but um, now you have now you have a new husband, right? Correct. And uh, you don't have that same oh, no. um, thing going on programming no dear one no dear one I figured it out I mean I figured it out you know and I did my homework and um, 
yeah, I returned to the self. I became self-actualized. I figured out all the faulty programs. I replaced them, rewired my mind, um, worked on myself and discovered value, became accountable. So like, you know, when I, re if I felt like I was, if I felt, I, you have to know one of the things that I ask what we present in the, in the coaching program is I help people figure out like, is this a non-codependent thought or is this a codependent thought? So we're developing the ability from the prefrontal lobe, thank heaven we have one, but we're developing the ability to observe the way we're acting and observing how we're behaving and observing our intentions. And we're asking ourselves, is this coming from a place of lack where I want this person to validate me? Or is this fear? Am I chasing this person out of fear? Is this the person I really, really want? And so, learning to question, is this a codependent thought or a non-codependent thought, you know, um, is very valuable. And slowly we learn to set boundaries. Um, we learn to be accountable. We understand what went wrong. We understand the brain. We apply what we learn to everyday life. You have to know what you're doing wrong. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, actually, this is really good just to hear that you've managed awesome. to get through that as well, because it's just um, sometimes I see like I, I might see the therapist and he says these things, but sometimes you kind of question, is it really possible? <laughs> like, but yeah, yeah, like it's good to see that, you know, oh, people yeah. like you. Yeah. Are, you know, if, um, if you go on, if you go on my website, you'll see the testimonial and you can read some testimonials. I mean, I've had neuroscientists come through my class. I coach psychiatrists and psychotherapists, um, therapists, social workers. And they're applying this to their their own their own lives and their own clients. Um, you absolutely can change your life. You have to know. I always say it. You can't fix a hole in the wall you can't see. So, healing from codependency is getting very very clear about what it is, how it's showing up in our life, and what we're doing to perpetuate it. And then being accountable, slowly learning like, oh, I did that. I shouldn't have done that. And the, the Facebook community that comes with the class is very instrumental, you know, because you're talking to other people who are going through the same thing all day long, you know, and the moderators and I are in there asking questions and answering questions. So you're getting constant reinforcement, you know, um, and the way that I laid the program out was I could sell this class, right? And just say, okay, there you go. There's 12 weeks of lessons and, you know, you can go through them as you wish. I don't do that because um, I studied the science of learning because I really wanted people to change with this program and people learn in bite-sized pieces of information. That's the best way to learn. And so every week they get a little bit of information and, you know, you process that for a week, then another bite-sized piece of information and you process that. And every week these lessons are being layered in your mind and you're developing new neural pathways, you know, for this information and you your brain is really changing. So the answer is yes, you can actually change. Very That's exciting. Amazing. Thanks so much for this. Um, and thanks for um, doing this oh. webinar. It's really nice of you. Oh, sure. Sure, absolutely. And you guys you guys will all get a, um, a follow-up email with a copy of it too. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Thank you, James. Thank you for thanks. being committed Bye. to healing. Thanks. Bye now. Bye. That concludes our um, webinar for the day. We It's now 7.44. I really hope that you've taken some wonderful tidbits of information and you're able to apply it to your life. Um, I will, you're gonna be getting a follow-up email, like I said, and um, I just wanna thank you for being here. And um, please look into the 12-week Breakthrough Coaching Program. You can find it at www.lisaaromano.com. And again, the early bird registration countdown is live now. It's all automated. So as soon as the early bird is up, the price will go up a little bit. So if you're interested, please don't miss that opportunity. And our Facebook group has already begun to form and people are getting to know one another. So I look forward to possibly helping you more personally on your healing journey. And thank you for those who so bravely offered your uh, input today. From the bottom of my heart, you know, um, I want you to know that recovery is possible. And if you're here 
you're, you're my people. You are somebody who really wants to heal from this and you're willing to do the work. And that says a lot about you. Um, and so it'd be an honor to work with you more personally. So I hope I hear from many of you soon. Namaste, dear ones. Until next time. Bye for now. Hi, everyone. My name is Jean and I live in New York City. And I just finished Lisa's 12 week breakthrough coaching program. And I would like to present my testimonial and um, show you how the program changed me and has helped me. And I wrote it all down, so I'm going to read it off my paper. To all those out there who feel like depression has them caught in a kind of cave or mine shaft, there is help and hope. For me, this came in May of this year. Before then, I was functional and seemingly fine on the surface but I was masking a lot of pain. My actions were born out of so much dysfunction and plainly out of my faulty programming, as Lisa says. Since I am the product of a home in which par both parents abused alcohol, I became the archetype of a codependent. Self-harm in the form of eating disorders, workaholism, and other behaviors shrouded me and followed me into my 40s. Although I could identify them, and I did manage to shed some of the behaviors, um, I held on to many familiar forms of self-neglect, along with dissociating from my feelings and taking care of others to avoid feeling my feelings. So in my fifth decade, I still had no tools to begin to rearrange my ideas about myself and my past experiences or to heal my PTSD. And then came along Lisa Romano. I have worked professionally as an educator since 1984 so I can speak with authority when I tell you that Lisa is a very gifted teacher. She seems to be voraciously looking for more information to synthesize and to make accessible for people like me to use. She also makes it all look so easy and she is passionate about helping others since she also once herself felt very trapped by her own painful past experiences. The understanding she brings comes along with decades of experience, skill and care. She has become a model for my recovery and the person who illuminates the way forward. I feel hope for the first time as an adult. Before discovering Lisa's work, much of the depression I felt came from the feeling that there is nothing or no one out there who can make up for all of the loss that I have experienced and suffered. Loss of relationship with my parents, loss of relationships with my siblings and others, but it is Lisa's work which for me has done this her 12-week breakthrough coaching program, which comes with meditations, live stream Q&As, journaling prompts, and a Facebook group, along with her YouTube channel posts, are all game changers for me. So far, I have read her first two books, The Road Back to Me and My Road Beyond the Codependent Divorce, where she lays out the details of the life experiences that have led her to the work she is doing now and to the person who she is today. These books for me fulfilled the purpose for which she wrote them. That is, they're the proof that if one can believe in oneself a little bit, and as she says, have the faith of a mustard seed, then one can find a way out out of the pain into a healthy and happy life. Many of us codependents have had to parent ourselves without the proper skills for this task, which was extremely painful and heartbreaking. It is clear that Lisa had to do this for herself and now she brings these self-taught skills and much more to all those who will listen. I tell you, all you need to do is listen to Lisa. Hashtag listen to Lisa. Thank you.